चेयरपर्सन श्री श्री कृष्ण कुलकर्णी डायरेक्टर प्रोफेसर उत्तम कुमार सरकार डीन एकेडमिक प्रोफेसर भास्कर चक्रवर्ती डीन न्यू इनिशिएटिव्स एंड एक्सटर्नल रिलेशंस प्रोफेसर अनीश ठाकुर चेयर एम बी प्रोग्राम प्रोफेसर अभिषेक गोयल स्टूडेंट्स फैकल्टी एलमनाई गैस फ्रेंड्स लेट मी begin by saying what a great privilege it is to deliver the 33rd lecture of the institute lecture series at IIM Calcutta as a foreign minister i have chosen to address you all on a topic that you might think is obvious india and the world but there is a reason for doing that beyond it being my immediate subject of jurisdiction I'm conscious of speaking to a generation poised on the threshold of their professional life for whom the world matters as never before. Let me take this occasion to tell you why. For a start, you might want to reflect how a pandemic that first engulfed a distant Chinese city then went on to take over your lives so completely for more than two years. Or how an ongoing conflict in Europe is now impacting our daily cost of living. And indeed, for that matter, the implications that climate events can have on the many processes that we take so much for granted. Or it could be a different kind of trauma Terrorism, for instance, where any of us to be caught up in an act of cross-border terrorism or distantly inspired violence. In some cases, as we saw with students trapped in Ukraine or travelers stranded during COVID, that might happen when we are out of the country. But in others, be it COVID itself, conflict, terrorism, or natural disasters, such developments can come right to our doorstep, sometimes even inside our homes. Now, that does not mean that we need to be apprehensive about the world or even defensive in our approach. The flip side of the very interdependence that I underline with those examples is that the same world is full of opportunities and possibilities. If we brought back 7 million plus Indians during COVID through the Vande Bharat mission, it is because the India of today utilizes the global workplace so effectively. It is due to the fact that our talents and skills are now an intrinsic element of global innovation, manufacturing, and services. It is also reflective of how many Indians actually travel for personal, professional, or tourism purposes. Indeed, these very issues are now central to Indian diplomacy. We strive to ensure better access to our talent, stronger protection for our workers, greater opportunities for our students, and fairer markets for our businesses. But the world is not simply about mobility and migration. It is as much about partnerships, compacts and understandings that serve all parties well. In fact, a deeper engagement could mean accelerating our national development, exploring more markets, procuring resources, improving our quality of life, and not least, shaping crucial global issues that will determine the future of our planet. In truth, the globalized era in which we live is a double-edged world. It is hard to separate the vulnerabilities from the dependence or the risks from the benefits. The very mobility that brought COVID to our homes was otherwise such an enormous source of livelihood for so many. The supply chains which created disruption when they did not function were a boon when they did. Their complexity 
may be hard to overstate, as indeed their salience to critical aspects of our life. Let me give you two contemporary examples to highlight this aspect. The manufacturing of vaccines in India required ingredients and products from multiple countries and actually needed diplomatic intervention for them all to come through smoothly at that time. Conversely, many nations in the Gulf were dependent on our exports for the daily consumption of food, and that too had to be ensured through dialogue with them and through interventions uh, at home. Indeed, if there is one big takeaway for the global economy from the COVID experience, it is one of more reliable and resilient supply chains. The just-in-time approach with its over-centralization in a limited geography has shown its downside very graphically. De-risking the world economy now requires a balancing just-in-case policy with more centers of production. Where India is concerned, this could mean another chance to board the bus of manufacturing that we had unfortunately missed a few times before. As you can see, this is exactly what the easier to do business approach and the offer of production linked incentives of the Modi government are intended to ensure. Now the last few years have also compelled us all to be much more digital. We in India actually have a record that I must tell you through my own interactions with counterparts and people abroad, a record that is generating respect across geographies. The scale of our digital delivery, whether it is food, finance, health, pension, or social benefits, the scale of it is today very much a talk of the world. Here too, the visible efficiency of the transformation has been accompanied by the risks of growing, uh, risks of data privacy and data security. Where our data resides and who harvests it matters increasingly in an era of artificial intelligence. The political sociology of such residency or processing is no longer irrelevant. As a result, trust and transparency have become important guiding factors in digital decision making. Now, beyond the intricacies of supply chains and the vulnerability of data harvesting, there is a larger change today underway in international affairs that it's very important you comprehend. This emanates from the weaponization of everything. In recent years, we have already seen how trade, connectivity, debt, resources, and even tourism have become points of political pressure. The Ukraine conflict has dramatically widened the scope for such leveraging. The scale of financial measures, technology controls, infrastructure and service restrictions, and seizure of assets has truly been breathtaking. At the same time, it is also a fact that global rules and practices have been gamed for national advantage in a manner that can no longer be overlooked. Sharpening great power competition is inevitably creating stress factors across multiple domains. At one level, it induces greater caution about international exposure, but beyond a point that cannot be safeguarded since the very nature of our existence is now globalized. For each nation, especially the major ones, a set of answers have to be found that optimize costs and benefits. This has led to a revival of interest in strategic autonomy, now redefined as ensuring national capabilities in core and sensitive areas. In that sense, we are not just moving towards a different model of global interaction, but also one of greater national opportunities. In India, we know that as Atma Nirbhar Bharat. There is no question now that foreign policy has deep personal implications for all of us, 
because it impinges on so many aspects of our life. It could be your safety, your welfare, your prospect or your opportunities. It has transactional and collaborative connotations, especially in the economic and technology domains. Friend shoring and trusted providers are likely to be concepts that will gain ground in the coming days. As before, foreign policy is a constant exercise of building power and exercising influence, whether for national or collective purpose. It can be a competition too for ideas, values or culture in order to set forth a vision for the future. Each of these facets coexist with the others, much more intensively perhaps in an era of interdependence and interpenetration. International relations itself is now played out in more domains with much greater integration than before. But precisely because it impacts each one of us so deeply, it is essential that we have an obligation to take interest in the games that nations play. Now, it is a paradox that in many ways, even as we speak about the advancements of technology and the promise of science, world politics is actually moving back to the future. Some of this arises from the reality that expectations placed on globalization prove to be over-optimistic. This is not to suggest that the underlying economic interdependence is not well-founded, but by widening differences between and within societies and creating new global power equations, a different set of counter forces have now been set into motion. Once challenges began to be articulated, the globalization model was actually not easy to defend because the benefits were heavily skewed in favor of a few. The political manifestation of globalization has also created its own backlash when self-appointed custodians of correctness sit in judgment over global happenings across a very wide set of domains, they cannot get away with it forever, especially when they themselves have a vested interest in the outcomes. To add to that, there is also now a proclivity to advance national methodologies that often verge on the mercantilist. We therefore have a situation where political and social identities have sharpened, sharpened to a point where they create an inherent and unresolvable tension with the nature of economic flows in the world. Consequently, different nations are struggling to find an optimal balance, though the reason for each one of them may be a little different. Some seek to address regime security, Others want to protect their technology leads or sometimes their way of life. And still more, who would like, people like us for instance, who would like to build capabilities without exposing them too early to a competition that is often manifestly unfair. These endeavors are likely to be among the fundamental characteristics of world politics of our era. The, our globalized world is likely to be both fractured and semi-coupled in select areas. There is moreover old-fashioned national rivalry also at play. It hasn't really gone away in a globalized world. Especially after 2008, the world has seen a sharper rebalancing and the emergence of multipolarity. The shifting terms of US engagement to the world in the last decade is one dimension. The ending of a forever war in Afghanistan appears to herald new ways of ensuring its security and furthering its interests. The rise of China is an equally profound development, one whose global consequences are becoming more apparent with each passing day. That so much of it is happening outside orthodox constructs is clearly challenging conceptually to both policymakers and to analysts. Far from being a zero-sum game, these developments have actually opened up space for other players, some essentially regional, but some with greater potential. 
clearly the world perceives India to be in the latter category. To this dynamic process, the Ukraine conflict has now highlighted the centrality of Russia and the strategic awakening of Europe. If this matrix looks complicated, then the volatility is further compounded by the uncertainty of the larger global arena. The unfairness of globalization and the stresses of the COVID experience have been aggravated by the shortages and costs that derive from developments in Ukraine. As a result, we are headed for a far more uncertain, I would say even insecure existence than we may have predicted just a few years ago. Now, such a prospect clearly calls for more diplomatic energy and greater political creativity because it has to harmonize the pursuit of national interest with a responsibility for collective good. For a nation like India, where such a large segment of our population is so vulnerable, this means, above all, to mitigate the impact of key negative trends. In doing so, we not only stand up for our own welfare, but we speak as well on behalf of the Global South. At the same time, we also have an obvious stake along with them in cooling down overheated global politics. This is obviously not going to happen overnight, yet we must persevere. But beyond the immediate compulsions, there are structural challenges of the current world order that confront us. The oldest trick in the diplomatic book is to freeze the moment to your advantage. That, in fact, is what some countries have done with multilateralism since 1945. Pursuing reform in that domain, especially in the United Nations, and striving to ensure that decision-making reflects democratic reality is therefore a quest of no small importance. Allowing the past to dictate terms is, however, not just a predicament that can be attributed to others. Sometimes it is actually a mindset or an assumption that we impose on ourselves because of a particular moment of our experience which continues to resonate. Thus, even 60 years later, the 1962 conflict with China shapes many of our attitudes. Our hesitations with the West similarly derive from the experience of 1948, 1965, and 1971. This even applies on the positive side of the ledger, where it can lead sometimes to unintended complacency. The 1992 economic reforms, for example, were impactful enough that the need for continuous building of national capabilities was not given the requisite priority till recently. We are now in a phase where both the ability and the responsibility for shaping the global landscape are much greater. It is expressed in new concepts that reflect our interests like the Indo-Pacific, mechanisms like the Quad or the I2U2, or initiatives like the International Solar Alliance. Even on the economic front, we have been judicious in the manner and extent of engaging the world, picking the FTAs and framework that truly serve our interests. For all of us, the security of the nation obviously should come above all else. My own experience is that Indians are much more conscious of national security than many other people, since it has been so often challenged in the last 75 years. Indeed, when we evaluate the merits of leadership, for us, it is largely perceived as a mix of development delivery and crisis response. A lot of our foreign policy is devoted to preparing for, obviating, mitigating, and reacting to national security threats. But clearly, a time has come when we need to decisively address long-standing vulnerabilities that a competitive world regularly exploited. We need to equally apply ourselves to the hard task of securing our borders effectively without allowing systemic flaws to dilute them. 
At the same time, as the world penetrates into our daily existence more prominently, we must develop the awareness and responses to the problems that are actually posed by the normal. This could be digital, it could be financial, ideological, or sometimes just old-fashioned mobility. So even as we overcome constraints, hurdles, habits, and sometimes black swans, it is absolutely necessary for the young generation to understand how the world looks at us now. Indeed, many of the very challenges of the last few years have earned us great credit for coming through in the manner in which we did. There are, to my mind, 10 broad reasons why we are now taken more seriously, even as we are moving towards becoming a leading power. And those 10 reasons are, one, our handling of the COVID, including vaccine production, shots in the arm, the COVID platform, and vaccine Maitri. Two, the robust economic recovery and the digitally enabled socio-economic delivery on a massive scale. This is important because the global economy continues to face serious headwinds. Three, our growing economic relevance to the world, reflected in greater FDI inflows, greater manufacturing, stronger exports, and an embrace of startups. Four, an independent foreign policy in an increasingly polarized world, one that also speaks for the global south. Five, an innovative diplomacy that has introduced new concepts and platforms, as I mentioned, without according a veto to others on our choices. Six, a resolute national security policy that has seen us standing up to daunting challenges in the border areas, even during the COVID period. Seven, a determination to look after our own abroad, be it Operation Ganga in Ukraine or Operation Devi Shakti in Afghanistan. Eight, a willingness to look out for others and often serve as a first responder in humanitarian or disaster response situations, especially in our own neighborhood. Nine, contributing to a global betterment through initiatives in solar energy, disaster resilience, maritime security, and counterterrorism, amongst others. And 10, a perception that India as a civilizational state is finding its place once again in the global order. Now the combination of changes in our political standing, our economic weight, technology capabilities, cultural influence, and the successes of our diaspora is moving India today into a higher orbit. But let us not underestimate the task ahead. For any power to rise in the global order is never easy. But to do so amidst the turbulence that I have described is doubly difficult. But nevertheless, we see a growing recognition in the world that India is now getting its act together. Equally, there is a realization that the big issues of our times cannot be solved without India's contribution or participation. This is a moment when India resets the terms of engagement with the world. It is also a juncture where we should be prepared to take up greater responsibilities. So, for those who are starting off in life, like so many of you, I can only say that there is every reason to be confident. India today has a leadership and a vision, as well as the perseverance and the commitment to enhance its global standing. To those more experienced who have been part of our national journey for the last 75 years, they will surely appreciate the transformation underway and the opportunities that it has generated 
opportunities perhaps that my generation did not have. But to all of them, I would only say that I'm sure that they share the conviction that today India matters more in the world and we must make the most of it. Thank you.